Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rodale Institute's uh, webinar series. Uh, I'm Gladys Zinati, and I'm Director of Vegetable Systems Trial. And it gives me the great pleasure today to share with you the information we have gathered on Vegetable Systems Trial in a webinar titled Vegetable Nutrient Quality and Soil Health in the Vegetable Systems Trial, VST. It is our fourth season updates. And give you some housekeeping before we start the presentation. First, you can hear me, but if I am not audible for you, please click the audio settings on your screen. And at the end of the presentation, I will have a QA session. And for that, I would uh, request that you will enter all your questions under the QA button on the screen, because I'm not going to check the chat um, button there. And uh, for any other problems, please write down the phone number for 610-683-1481. And that's to call Maria Pope, the education director, in case you encountered any problem during the uh, session. This presentation is recorded and it will be posted on our website in a week from now. And to better focus on the presentation, I will turn off my camera at this point and I will come back to you during the uh, QA session. First, I would like to acknowledge our funders, the generosity of our funders that they have been uh, funding our vegetable systems trial here uh, for the past five years and including Wincote Foundation, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, uh, Johnny Seeds, uh, Pennsylvania Vegetable Growers Association, and the Orange County Community Foundation. Uh, in this uh, webinar, I would go briefly and quickly on uh, what's VST and highlight some of the results we have gathered and give you some updates on the current and the research projects I am working on and the dissemination of the results, the venues I am taking and what do we have for future plans uh, for years to come. And at the end of the presentation, I would be uh, having time for a QA session and we will receive all your questions and hopefully we'll get time to answer them all. So in brief, as I said, uh, vegetable systems trial is a long-term side-by-side uh, comparison of the organic systems to the conventional vegetable cropping systems. And these systems are uh, put in a randomized system in uh, four different blocks. So in each block or replicate, you will have the organic system and the conventional system. And within those, you will have the crops that we will talk about. Uh, to give you a more uh, focused area here, this is a conventional system and this is organic of one block and you will see the management practices is uh, in each of those systems would be tillage covered with plastic and you can see that in both and then compared to the reduced tillage which in this case in the convention we apply a herbicide to kill the cover crop and here we just roll crimp the cover crop. And when I say uh, reduce till uh, roll crimping, meaning we have the cover crop that we come during the springtime, use the roller crimper that has been developed at Rodale Institute and we roll the cover crop. It becomes like a mulch mat. And that uh, is used for mostly uh, the crops that we have, except that for potato, uh, of course, uh, we use a different equipment, which I will talk about it in a minute. And we compare reduced tillage to full tillage by plowing with moldboard plow and cover with plastic. And for potato, we compare side by side the potato that is grown in plastic with the moldboard and plastic, as well as the reduced tillage. In that case, for potato, we use the chisel plow uh, to 
minimize the disturbance of the soil. Uh, if you want more details on the management practices, I recommend that you tap to this uh, website that shows the previous uh, webinar I gave last year, nearly exact time like last this time. And in this webinar I gave last year, I have a detailed information about uh, the management practices, the equipment we use, and whatever you need to know about uh, vegetable systems trial management practices. In the vegetable systems trial, we uh, focus on five vegetable crops. These include the potato representing the root, the beans and the winter squash and the sweet corn, they represent the fruits, and the lettuce representing the leaf. A uh, decision came on what we use in this vegetable system soil was based on recommendations that we got from the advisory committee, mainly that include scientists, researchers, educators, as well growers in the region and in Pennsylvania. And when I say region, meaning in the mid-Atlantic region. And so based on these recommendations, these are the crops that we selected to do uh, this trial on. The overarching goals of the vegetable systems trial, mainly to look at the cropping systems impact, as well as the management practices on soil health. Because everything we do, it will impact the different properties of the soil, chemistry, biology, or physical properties. And we would like to see how those properties or the soil health will impact the plant health and nutrient quality, as well as the ecosystem services and environmental health. But most importantly, we would like to link all the way soil health, plant health, environment to the human health, because at the end, this is what we really need to focus our consumption of vegetables that are really grown in healthy environment and in healthy soil. The objectives of vegetable systems trial mainly is to provide our vegetable growers with viable economic options for a long-term sustainable vegetable cropping system, mainly by working with this scientific-based information we collect, uh, make recommendations, help them to adopt the management practices that seem optimal to improve the soil health, at the same time, uh, making sure that these systems or the practices they are using enhance the nutrient quality of the crops they are harvesting, and at the same time, improving the health of the environment. However, the long-term objective, as I said, improving human health, and that if we focus on the grower and what the grower is going to do, and make sure the soil is healthy and using the practices that really improve the water quality, nutrient quality, and the environment, we will be with time be able to show that we are reducing the pesticide applications that impacts the environment and the humans. We will be able also to start recommending uh, about what kind and uh, what type of vegetables that are rich in minerals and vitamins and ox antioxidants and that hopefully it will improve the marketability, improve the availability and the consumption. And it is now in our era in these days, as we all have been through this pandemic uh, globally with the COVID-19, it became important for us that we boost our immune system and reduce our illnesses. And by using uh, vegetables that are rich in uh, antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals, and they are healthy, this will, uh, adding those to our diet, it will really, with time, show reduction of chronic diseases, illnesses, and improving our health. So, out of these five, today I'm going to talk about the sweet corn, and why sweet corn? Because sweet corn is really beneficial. It has uh, lots of uh, phosphorus, potassium, and manganese. Also, it is a great source of vitamins such as vitamin A, B1, B3, B6, and vitamin C. 
It is a good source for antioxidants and polyphenols. And these, they boost the immune system. It provides about 342 calories for every 100 grams of sweet corn, as well as it aids in laxat as a laxative and it provides a good source of dietary protein. At Rodale in the BST, we start our seeds, uh, our seedlings from seeds in the greenhouse. The variety we use is coastal. It is a uh, bought from Seedway. We get organic seeds for the organic system and treated seeds for the conventional. We usually have our seedlings between the age of seven and 12 days. Anything about eight to nine or 10 days is uh, optimal for uh, uh, transplanting. Anything beyond 12, as our uh, re uh, research showed, it, these seedlings will not do a good job. They will not grow well because of the rooting uh, in the cells, in these small cells. They will start circling and they will not uh, regrow again very well. So we grow uh, sweet corn on black plastic and we have three uh, beds on each plot. And in each uh, bed, we have two rows of uh, seedlings and the distance between these seedlings, between these rows is about 18 inches and the distance between the seedlings in the row is about 12 inches. We give them starter fertilizer, fish emulsion for the organic and soil grow starter for the conventional when we have the water wheeler here. We are not doing at this moment uh, reduced tillage for corn, but this is another project that we started this fall and we are gonna look into it two years. And if uh, showed it is an excellent job and we are doing an excellent job in finding that we are growing it very well in reduced tillage, we are gonna incorporate it in the vegetable systems trial. So we will look forward for that project in two years from now. During the season, we do pest scouting and we do that on six consecutive weeks. And we start sometime about uh, when the plant has about seven or eight leaves and any time before silking. And in that time, we take five plants randomly each week and we, uh, from each plot, and then we look at the different uh, uh, insects and we record them. The insects that we are interested in is the European corn borer. This is um, the beige color here, brownish with the wavy wings. This is a nocturnal moth that comes during the night. Most of the time you don't see it during the day. Lays the eggs at the back of the leaf. And when they hatch, the uh, larvae comes out and then they start making holes and then they bore through the stock. And so that's what they call them borers. The corn earworm, is this one here. It is another nocturnal moth and it is beige in color. It lays the eggs on the silk. So you have to watch for that, especially when you start having the, the silk there, you will have to go and scout and make sure that if there are any insects there and the egg laying. And when they hatch, they start feeding on the silk and on the kernel itself. The field armyworm, which is here on this uh, bottom picture, this comes later in the season and this is the frass that it causes and makes shot holes here. And this sometimes either it is a miss or a hit. It depends on the time you um, uh, uh, plant or transplant your seedlings and the length of the maturity of your uh, sweet corn. 
when we do our pest scouting, uh, that's important because it tells us uh, whether we have good beneficial insects in the area. It tells us if we have any damage showing there and if uh, we are seeing problems, we will try to make sure that we spray before the threshold and we use for organic javelin and for conventional asana. Our uh, variety that we use, it is a mid-season maturing cultivar, about 77 days. But between the 72 and 77, we keep looking and we're checking on every day, uh, the years. And it is not only important that they have these brownish uh, silk tassels, but also we look at the um, kernel itself. So we check if they are plumped and milky sometimes. It, they become plump, but they are starchy and they are not ready for pick. So they have to be uh, plumped and milky. What we do, we take 10 years per plot and we take uh, data on the yield for the fresh with the husk and without the husk. And we take more data in the lab for ear length, the number of rows per year, the number of kernels longest vertical row. And then we take the whole plant and we do uh, record the dry weight by mass. As far as nutrient analysis on the sweet corn, what we do is that the corn uh, ears that we have there, we shave them and we store the uh, collection of uh, sweet corn uh, kernels into plastic bags labeled for each treatment and the date was harvested and the system we used it. And then we put it in a freezer at minus 20 centigrade. And then uh, when it is time, we take it out. We take samples and we put them on the freeze dryer. And then uh, we grind it and subsample it. And we send them to different laboratories to do analysis for minerals, proteins, vitamin B6, and vitamin C. Now, because of our limited fu funding we have, uh, we are only taking total protein and two vitamins, but it is my wish that uh, to have more funding that allow me to do a, a amino acids profiling, meaning all the amino acids, the essential and the non-essential and make more analysis on the vitamins uh, more than these two. So let's look at the yield, and that's data from 2018 and 2019. So uh, CNV on the x-axis means conventional, ORG means uh, organic, and this is of 2018. On the y-axis, it is the yield in pounds per acre. The green bars, they are representing the uh, fresh ear and the yellow bars that are representing the husk ears. And I put them next to each other to show you the proportions of the, the, the cover of the husk compared to the ear itself. And here it shows in 2018, we got more of the yield in the, in the uh, conventional more than the organic, but it is not by much difference. And when we look at the 2019, both of them have increased, but they were no significant statistically different from each other. And so uh, that could be due to the amount of rain that we had during 2019, that it continuously rained during the spring and summer time. For the protein, uh, you could see here, and in 2018, no difference between the percent protein if it is conventional organic ranged about averaging 15.9. But when we looked at 2019, you could see here that um, the percent protein was much less in the conventional compared to the organic. So the organic was higher, but both of them, they were lower than what we had in 2018. When we look at uh, vitamin B6 and 
just to back up a little bit here before I explain this, what is important vitamin B6? As uh, you may know, or some of you know, that vitamin B6 is very important for the brain development, for keeping our immune system healthy, and it's important for heart health, as well as to ensure normal functioning of the digestive system, mainly the digestive enzymes, and it works pretty well a good role in the uh, mood of regulation. And amount that is required by vitamin B6 for the uh, recommended daily value or uh, uh, allowance would be for adults, it's about 1.7 milligrams. And so uh, it shows here that we have uh, part of that 1.7 milligrams uh, per day is needed. We can uh, tap into sweet corn to get some percent out of it to include in our diet. However, when we look at vitamin C, the scenario is totally different. And just before I explain uh, this uh, uh, graph here, uh, as you may know that vitamin C is really important for uh, growth and development. It is important for repairing the body tissues and uh, play a, an important role in wound healing in skin, blood vessels and bones and it promotes absorption of iron. So for people who are anemic and they also need to make sure they have enough vitamin C to improve the iron absorption in their uh, digestive system and uh, boost uh, their immune system as well. In, uh, in the news, you may have heard that improving your immune system during the COVID that to take uh, vitamin C in your diet, and that really helps to uh, against any diseases that we may have uh, during this time. Coming back to this graph, in 2018, the organic uh, vitamin C showed more than the conventional, but it dipped down in 2019, and it could be due to some of the uptake minerals in the nutrients in the leaves and uh, still we have not received the data yet of the 2019 uh, for the minerals so I couldn't make sure uh, what is the reason but this is on my radar to see what is uh, the reason for dipping but uh, with the 2020 we are going to add those information and see what is the cause that increase or decrease on these vitamins. The another project, it is about the colored flesh potato. Uh, I want you to keep tuned to that and we will talk about them next week. So uh, sign up. It is free webinar. I'm going to be at the same time, November 12, 2 to 3 and I would be presenting on the management practices for this colored potato for nutrient quality and soil health. Hopefully I will get some data from the labs. I can't promise, but we'll hope we can uh, provide you with that. So I want to acknowledge also my collaborators on this is Dr. Lavanya Redivari from Purdue University. She is uh, working with me and I'm working with her on the different varieties for the nutrient quality. And our uh, uh, favorite um, grower, Jen Halper, she is at Dickinson College Farm and she is going, uh, she already tried this year uh, using different colored potatoes. And so these are my collaborators on this project. So last year I talked about deep soil cores. And so what did we do with those? So in the fall 2019, we got uh, these uh, liners that have deep soil cores and we took them and we start uh, uh, cutting them into sections during that uh, cold winter. And um, here we sectioned them into 10 centimeters, 20, uh, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 100. 
And today I'm gonna just focus on these uh, three levels. And, but we are working on all the levels because this is the area that I just got data for you. Uh, many of the labs were closed and some of the data even not yet analyzed or sampled, not analyzed because the labs are still closed since March. But I am happy to share with you some of those findings that we got. Um, mainly, all these sections, we will be looking at physical properties, chemical properties, and the biological properties. And today, I will focus on total carbon, total nitrogen, the labile carbon, and organic matter. And we'll give you an update on the microbial community diversity and functionality. This is in collaboration with a colleague of mine, Dr. Kahn from Strauss Research Center, which I will talk about it in a few minutes. So let's start. So here I'm gonna show you uh, data on percent nitrogen carbon organic matter and the labile, we call it POC-C. It is the labile or reactive carbon. And here is the uh, soil surface and we put the, the the core, we take soil sample out and the data I'm showing, it would be for the first 10 centimeters, for the 20 centimeters and up to the 30 centimeters. So let's start. And so the percent nitrogen in the soil at the depth of zero to 10 showed that the organic has more nitrogen than the conventional. And similarly, in the deeper uh, uh, depth from 10 to 20, organic is higher. And in the deeper depth from 20 to 30. And that number about 0 0.3, 0 0.35 is really a good number to have for nitrogen. And then if we look at percent carbon, same trend, you could see that the organic soils they were higher in the organic carbon. They are sequestering more carbon there. And you could see that the number it is between 2.5 and 3.3 .3 for the organic. However, the conventional, it is pretty low, about 1.39, 2.6. I just want to make sure here one point that the site of vegetable systems trial started on totally 100% organic. It has been over 20 years being manipulated as organic. It was practiced organic and it was then when we started in 2016, the vegetable systems trial turned a part of it to conventional. So you could see that there were some decline in the carbon and probably there was a gain here. So now we are having more samples that coming from 2016 that we are going to look into them and compare them to 2019. And we want to continue doing that every year because it's important to show you and to show our growers how this data is really showing the practices and the systems are really building or really diminishing the sequestration of carbon into the soil and the health of the soil. So for organic matter, and in this one, it is the same thing. You will see the organic matter in the organic system is much greater and significantly from the conventional. And when we look at the labile carbon here, which is represented by epoxy, it, uh, it is the same. You will realize these are different numbers. These are milligrams. So the epoxy, it is a fraction of the or soil organic matter. But these are in milligram per kilogram, not in percent. So let's look more into this epoxy uh, in the next slide. So in this slide, it is the same data I, I gathered from there. And you could see, according to an RCS, this is a graph that I got from that uh, website. And this is an interpretation by Cornell University, Soil Health. And you could see, if we are looking at these numbers of the uh, labile uh, reactive carbon, you could see that the 900s, the 800s are 
over here. So these are the red zone, meaning it is a poor, uh, moderate, the yellow, and the bluish green, it is a high good quality so score for the soil. So if we are talking about uh, 800, 900, if you take it all the way to the curve, we are hitting a good score. So that is shows into the upper layer, 10 centimeter and 20 centimeter. When it is 400 in the organic, it's about here, we are in the red zone. But if we look at the conventional 770, which is about here, it is okay at the beginning, at this point. But if we go down 6900 and 200, 200 is in the bad zone. And uh, the 690, it would be about over here. So it is giving a score of 70. And that's what we want to see in two years, five years and 10 years. We want every other year, we want to see whether these numbers are gonna continue increasing or they are gonna diminishing and become in the yellow or red zone. It is known that the labile uh, carbon is one of the most uh, sensitive uh, uh, pool to cropping systems and management practices. And so this is a good one that we can always look at uh, along with the microbial biomass and the carbon that we sequester when we are looking into how the soil is treated. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Jen Jun Khan is a soil microbiologist. He's collaborating on this project and he is looking into microbial soil health. So out of these uh, two systems, uh, we took the samples from each depth and he is looking into the microbial composition, the diversity and the functional genes. And we are gonna link this microbial information to the vegetable yields and nutrient quality, how they are playing a role in improving the yields or not improving the yields in different systems and the quality of the nutrients. It's a very exciting uh, project that we are working on and we want to elaborate even more and more in the future uh, by uh, having more um, samples uh, every other year and build on this project uh, to learn about uh, different aspects. I want to thank also and acknowledge our funder, um, in part uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, who is being very generous to us in seeing and supporting our mission here. And this is a great pleasure to, to know that we are moving forward with more exciting uh, projects uh, uh, with Strouds and other collaborators. So uh, Jinjun takes the soil samples uh, that were cut from each one, run them in his lab uh, for uh, DNA, and he does the extraction with his research team there, and then they quantify them with uh, qPCR to look at the functional genes, and then he send them to look into the throughput uh, sequencing. And so he can get the information at the end to look into what is the kind or the composition of these microorganisms and to provide information about the diversity between management practices and cropping systems. So far, extraction is done. So far, the quantification is done and we are still in progress of uh, the sequencing. And then the next two steps to do are the nitrification, denitrification, that gives us information about the nitrogen cycling and putting all the information together. Definitely in 2021, we are gonna repeat the same thing in fall, but during the uh, winter and spring, we continue to learn about the communities, similarities and dissimilarities from Dr. Khan's uh, work. And we are gonna identify the potential indicators in the soil and link those to the vegetable production and correlate them. Another project we started this year. Uh, this is another exciting project. Uh, Dr. Wade Heller at the Eastern Regional Research Center 
uh, he is working on arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi. And I became so much interested in this a uh, long time ago, and I wanted to see if we can uh, link something about mycorrhizae with the nutrient uptake. And so uh, just to say what is mycorrhizae, it's a Greek word, myco means fungus and rhizae means the root. And what uh, you we use, uh, this is a bahia grass seedling in this picture. It is a quick seedling uh, that grows very quickly and colonize very well with mycorrhizae. And so uh, if you look under the microscope, you will see these hyphidis like are tunnels underground in the roots. And you will see small dots, these uh, dark dots over here. These, if you look more onto the microscope, these are arbuscules. They look like a small tree. They are so cute when you see them under the microscope. The, this means this root is inoculated. Now, if the root is not inoculated, it will be like a pipeline here without those small uh, uh, trees in them. The bottom picture here, it is a small balls, different colors and sizes. These are the uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae spores that they carry the, uh, the function year after year. They are staying in the soil and these represent different species. And so these are also the things that Dr. Eller would be looking at. And again, we have a funding from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and the USDA Department of Agriculture. The objectives of this project is that we would like to look at the diversity and functionality. And we are selecting about uh, nine uh, species of the arbuscular mycorrhizae. And mainly we want to see whether individuals or when we put them in combination will provide the most benefits for our uh, given crop. Also, we are gonna look how the management practices will affect the colonization and the growth of the plant, as well as the uptake of the nutrients and see if the, those plants such as in BST would be the uh, sweet corn, seedlings, the winter squash would be boosted, would be having better nutrient quality than the ones that they are not going to be inoculated. And we are going to show that in, in the coming uh, three years in this experiment. And this is very important. Why? Because we are going to provide or prepare our uh, inoculum in-house here. So Dr. Heller will bring the inoculated uh, seedlings of the bahia grass. We put them in grow bags and then we grow them. And this is a picture where we put each species replicated on a bench. So there would be no contamination between them when we water. And then uh, these will grow for the whole summer, uh, which we did. And then uh, next spring, we will harvest the bags per each variety and we'll inoculate our seedlings for VSD production. This is really easy way to do it. Once you prepare it, it takes care of itself, but we still need to water and weed. And this is really good for our growers because the, the growers, they have limited options for a, a viable, uh, available commercially good quality of AM fungi because sometimes they are sitting on the shelf for months and months and they might not be viable and not may inoculate pretty well, but the grower can produce it by themselves. And then who can reap the benefits, vegetable producers as well as other growers that they will use mycorrhizae. But since my work here is on vegetables, I will say vegetable producers, you will benefit from that. And farms that produce their own seedlings, they are the ones that can prepare all these grow bags and inoculate their seedlings, get them ready to take advantage of the symbiosis that they do with the roots and mycorrhizae when they put them in the uh, field. So uh, again, uh, Jan Halpan in two years, she is going to do an on-farm inoculum production. It is pretty simple. We'll uh, provide the grow bags and the material 
and we will be providing also the Bahia grass that pre inoculated with the AM fungi and will show and demonstrate how we usually do the inoculum, how we are going to uh, inoculate her seedlings and then she is going to uh, do that and compare them to the ones that are not inoculated and we'll gather data from her uh, college, uh, the Dickinson College farm and we compare them and we will assess the growth, we will assess the nutrient uptake and the root colonization. This is very exciting project. Another project I want to highlight is started this fall. It is a satellite project that the, in three years, whatever information we get from here, we would like to uh, look into it and uh, see how it feeds into vegetable systems trial. And this is funded totally by Gerber. Gerber is a well-known, a world-known uh, company. They work on having, uh, preparing, um, baby foods and uh, Gerber is very adamant about and strict regulations about what the food or the, the suppliers or the sourcers, the farmers that they are growing, not only uh, uh, crops that are healthy, uh, that are not beyond certain limits that the Gerber put as protocols in their uh, testing, but also they are having a vision to make sure that their growers or the people who are working with sourcing the crops from, that they are also stewards of the environment, stewards of uh, the soil health. And they want to work with us at Rodale and working with them is really a pleasure because we are going to look how cover crops and tillage practices may impact the carbon sequestration and uh, we are going to use summer squash as an example in this case but also we are going to look at the different properties of the soil. Uh, Gerber wants to, to show based on this three year period and want to explore it even more in different states where they get their uh, crops and collaborate with their growers. This is also an exciting project. As I said, um, uh, it is not enough if we just prepare, do the work and keep it in our uh, offices or in our labs and publish it, but it is important to disseminate it to our growers, to the public, to people who are interested, who could make difference in this world and help us. Um, during uh, the period of COVID, uh, which we are still going through, uh, we tried uh, to uh, communicate results uh, without going to field tours and in person. We hope that it will be next year and years to come and everyone is safe and healthy. Uh, we do uh, have a virtual field day. I put here for you the uh, site link and um, if you cannot uh, type it out uh, in a week from now, this webinar would be available online for free and you can go back to these links and uh, register for that link and then you will have a lifetime access to the virtual field day. Also we do webinars like today and next week and I'm sure my colleagues at Rodale they also do the same and uh, we have several web articles and publications and I am having here a a link for a radio interview with Food Sleuth that happened a month ago or two. And this is the information for the uh, radio interview. And we also do Facebook Live, which is part of our online um, uh, public information. We try to reach everyone in a different way. And hopefully it would be the COVID-19 over soon and we will start even having more tours and in field in person. 
the plans for the future in the coming five, 10 years to continue doing the, the same good job and compile data to assess the soil health indicators, to compile data on crop yields and nutrients, and to include even more on amino acids profile by nutrients and another amino acid that has not been published much about it uh, and it is uh, recent becoming important this ergothionine it is an amino acid that it is uh, developed by a fungus in the soil and this is not generated in the plant itself so meaning that there is a type of fungus in the soil that uh, in, in the uh, produce the ergothionine amino acid and if the plant for example it is published on oats they have ergothionine in the grain that is because the plant was uh, taking it up but it doesn't make it inside the plant so management practices may impact this amino acid and what it could be because you know fungus are in fact uh, impacted by tillage they are impacted by the quality of the management practice it could be by the fungicides so it is really interesting to look into ergothionine in the near future uh, with the support from our funders and more funders that are interested in addressing the soil health the plant health the ecosystem and the human health um, more in the uh, part to work on, uh, I'm interested in investigating water quality, pesticide accumulation in soil, water and crops, mainly to link soil health to water health and to uh, crops and uh, what is the residual effect of pesticides on water and in the environment and in the soil and in the crops. We have started a very a preliminary test uh, with the Health uh, Research Institute. We working on potato and winter squash. It is exciting to start working to learn more about it and we want to hit uh, the ground running in the future to investigate this area. And it would be uh, not uh, complete if we do not do more uh, networking and expanding our collaboration with medical doctor, nutritional scientists and educators because we need to work all of us together to complete this picture and what we need is to link soil health to human health with the collaboration of medical doctors who are focused on probably let's say I'm just giving an example here cancer cells or uh, on diabetes or something like that this is really important to link how we manage our soils to what we are eating and how it is our health is impacted. Definitely, we'd like to provide and continue providing growers and consumers with informed uh, recommendations to make informed decisions. And hopefully uh, our growers will produce the healthy soil, healthy crops, and then our consumers start looking and eating and including in their diets more of the food that it is rich in, in nutrients and so they can provide better immune system for themselves. And with that, I would like to thank you all for uh, registering and listening to my uh, webinar today. This is my phone number. This is my email. This is the mailing uh, address. And before we open the session for Q&A, I would just to make sure this is the link that you need if you want to listen to the interview I had. Also to remind you about the uh, upcoming webinar uh, it is next Thursday, same time, 2 to 3 Eastern time, and it is free. You can register from today. And if you want to listen to more webinars, this is the link for you to register for more webinars. I do hope that this information is really helpful for you. You are getting the best of it and uh, use it. And then here I'm going to open the 
a question answer session for you. And I'm going to look into the uh, button here that it is the QA button and see what questions do we have. There is a question from Ann Carey. And is there a reason why we don't test for antioxidant in the nutrient analysis, uh, such as with the MTTSA? Um, mainly um, because we want to, when we do the experiments and the analyses, we want to be continuously doing the same protocol and we could use some assays, but sometimes they will require uh, more um, material that is needed and focused. But this is option that can be considered just to let you know, by the time you look at the assay, by the time you look and budget for the personnel to do it, it may be more expensive than the nutrient analysis you send out for antioxidants. And so also the budget limits that will not allow those. But this is a very good uh, question answer in a way. And uh, we would be very happy to start looking into antioxidants, like I said, because uh, it really complete the picture for us. And this is very important. And so, uh, the antioxidants are really important. Maybe in the future, uh, we will have another grant and funding and we can explore that and uh, as you are suggesting. Another person um, asked uh, for the Gerber study or just in general, how do you plan to measure carbon sequestration? Okay, the carbon sequestration, it is, uh, we are gonna take different samples during the seasons and also we are going to look into the carbon from the initial time into the carbon that we have every year when we are taking samples we are going to look into the carbon stock there we will take measurements on the bulk density and so this is one way that we can look into the carbon sequestration and see how uh, these areas, because in each plot, we will be GPSing the area that we'll take samples from. From Jenny Gilbert, it says, thank you for the presentation. You are very welcome, Jenny. These are promising results. That's good news to, to hear. To what do you attribute the inconsistent results of the protein and vitamin contents of org V? Uh, conventional from 280. As I mentioned, we are not yet having all the complete information. Uh, as I said, 2019 results didn't come back. Uh, labs were still closed. We are hoping that we get those. And also we are kind of combined with the weather data and look into the, uh, the leaf tissue. We are going to look into the kernel and look also into the soil samples that we get data from and put them all together. And we hope that we can come up with a reasons or reason that gives that because these vitamins are really regulated by microorganisms and they are really regulated by how you manage the soil and also the weather conditions that you have. Another uh, comment here from Regina Windsor. It says, Dr. Zinati, thank you so much for this fascinating presentation. You are very welcome. I'm happy that you really liked it, Regina. The fungi and carbon sequestration is really, really interesting. And the sort of downstream effects, amino acid production, et cetera, and the organic practices. Would you please reiterate how organic practices impact nutrient profiles of vegetables in, in a statistically significant manner a little bit more. Yes, um, these uh, nutrients that we are looking at, that the nutrient profiles, whether they are in the minerals or they are in the vitamins, we are going to look at first as concentrations in the uh, material that we send for analysis, but also we are going to look into the production, uh, the total yield, and we consider also to look into what we call the nutrient content. 
So with the variabilities that we have, uh, or my, I may say the treatments we have and the cropping systems, could be that the management practices that we are using in the organic system may be different from the, which is different from the conventional. It will point to us uh, whether these profiles would be different, especially if we are going to look into the amino acids, would the system, because as you may know, as I said, the ergothionine is produced by a fungi. So could be the system or the practice that we are doing really affecting some of those microorganisms that Dr. Khan is going to show us and Dr. Weller is going to talk about and uh, show us in the mycorrhizae. So could it be that those together or one or more, they are really going to contribute when we look at them statistically, of course, we use statistical uh, analysis packages. And so we can compare these amino acid production arrays. I hope that complete. And I answered your question, Regina. If not, please let me know. And we can also uh, continue. Even after the webinar, you can send your uh, questions to, uh, to our um, director of education and also to the link that the director of education put for you to ask your questions. Another, key, another question came from uh, Lulu. It says, thank you very much, Dr. Zinaiti, for the useful information given. You are very welcome, Lulu. I hope this really uh, brings some light to your work and to your knowledge, and please share it with your colleagues uh, wherever you are. Jenny Gilbert, thank you. Okay, great. I'm happy that I answered your question. Another one from Lucy Wesley. Um, Thank you, Dr. Zanati. You are very welcome. I'm happy that you guys, you are really enjoying this webinar. And um, another comment here came. It says, Dr. Zanati, I'm looking forward to attend your second webinar on potato. Great. That's wonderful. That's a good reminder for everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you for your clear presentation. I'm very happy that I served you well today. And I'm going to just check one more thing before, let me see if we have anything else. Uh, there is, if I, I can go to the chat, I'm going to try. There is a question that came. In fact, it was a comment. Uh, it says, thank you very much, Dr. Zenit, for this excellent information given in this webinar. You are very welcome. Great. I am very happy uh, that you find it uh, informative. As I said, if you have more information or questions that you may have, please feel free to send your questions, even if it comes to your mind after we close the webinar today. And as a reminder for you uh, that we have the next webinar next week. And also um, we will talk more about uh, more in face live uh, uh, sessions in the during the winter and we'll keep you updated. And uh, finally, I want to say to you, stay healthy, eat well, include in your diets, a healthy food, rich with your uh, minerals, vitamins, and go out and have uh, vitamin D from the sun and stay healthy and be happy. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much.